good morning everyone an ignited mind is the most powerful weapon on the earth above the earth and under the earth and this is got through education education is the most profitable investment for the near future a warm welcome to all for today's webinar on crispr a genome editing tool that can change the course of human evolution as we all know the pandemic situation caused due to covid-19 across the globe has enforced us to get the benefits of webinar webinar plays a key role in helping us to move with the information on the current trends by connecting the people from various parts of the world before we start with the webinar i request all the participants to note few points i request all the participants to mute your audio the questions can be dropped in the q and a box it will be answered at the end of the session feedback form will be mailed to your registered mail ids in 24 hours after this webinar and after filling the feedback form e certificate will be generated i kindly request all the participants to use the chat box only for technical discussions it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our principal dr prakash dubey sir who has done msc phd from devia hilia university indore specialized in plant biotechnology he has been credited with many national and international publications and also many awards during his portfolio he has been associated with amc college from two decades and has been the backbone in the development of the college now i request our, our honorable principal dr prakash duvri sir administrative management college to address the webinar over to you sir yeah thank you pavitra madam good morning to you Thank respected you. trustees of paramhamsa foundation trust speaker for today's webinar dr nilanjana basu head of the department for today's program head of the department dr p sudharani also the convener for today's program faculty members of amc participants galaxy of scientific fraternity teaching community and students good morning to one and all present participating in this webinar on behalf of the management and the institution i cordially welcome all of you for this webinar being organized by the department of biotechnology aims administrative management college located at 18th kilometer banargatta road bangalore was a college established under paramhamsa foundation trust founded by dr k r paramhamsa as chairman of the trust Mrs Geeta Parmahamsa vice chairperson Ms Monica Kalluri vice president and Mr Rahul Kalluri executive vice president of the trust AMC college is affiliated to Bangalore University approved by All India Council for Technical Education New Delhi the college with a brand name as AMC was one of the first few private colleges affiliated to Bangalore University began its journey in the sector of education for imparting quality education to the society way back in 1993 started with courses like bachelor of hotel management and catering technology master of business administration and master of computer applications amc group of educational institutions contribute to the society by offering a range of courses in management computer applications hotel management commerce aviation management biotechnology engineering courses a wide range of branches at ug and pg levels the group imparts education in the sector through four schools two pu colleges two engineering colleges two colleges of offering general degree and pg programs established itself as one of the largest educational groups in south bangalore for over three and a half decades administrative management college offers a wide range of courses like bhm bca bcom bcom in retail management bcom in insurance and actuarial studies bba general bba aviation management bsc biotechnology mba mca and msc biotechnology bsc fashion and apparel design bsc interior design courses are being introduced from the present academic year by meeting the required standard quality procedures the institution is accredited by national assessment and accreditation council nac government of india 
about 850 students are presently pursuing their studies in the college. About 40% of the students are from other parts of Karnataka and from other states as well, residing in hostels on campus, a huge campus spread over 52 acres with all the amenities required for importing higher education. With the teaching, non-teaching and supporting staff of the college, and the college strives to impart quality education as per the NAC assessment and guidelines, focusing on academics and even equally training the students for projects, seminars, industry academia interaction, and placements and training, and a special importance to cultural and sports events for overall personality development of the students. COVID-19 situation worldwide and also in our country made us to change the mode of learning from conventional classroom teaching to the present online mode of education. We could successfully complete the syllabus through online mode and waiting for the directions from the university for the conduction of examinations. There used to be a very happy moments on the mm -hmm. campus with the students, a lot of activities by organizing various programs, graduation day, seminars, placements and training activities, and most importantly, the relish a food festival being organized by the Department of Hotel Management every year. We miss all the students and all the activities, examinations also for the last four months. However, we are not apart. With implementation of technology, we can be connected to each other. I request the participants to keep in contact with the convener of this event for the forthcoming events and webinars being organized by the college. Please visit elearn.amcgroup.edu.in for the details. A number of webinars are being organized in the next 20 days. The present topic for discussion is CRISPR a genome editing tool that can change the course of human evolution it is a very advanced tool of molecular genetics applied in scientific field. There is enough time for all of us now to learn and focus on new techniques and acquire knowledge in the frontier areas of advanced scientific learning related to biological sciences. With the present situation of COVID pandemic, I appeal to all of you not to become panic and suggest all to you to stay clean, use masks, following social and physical distance, using sanitizers frequently. I request to stay safe. Standing strong and facing the challenging situations is the beauty and essence of life. Don't waste your time and keep learning. I once again welcome all the participants from teaching and scientific fraternity and also the students for this webinar. Thank you very much. Over to the technical team. Thank you very much, sir, for briefing us about the college and also telling the precautionary measures to be taken at this time uh, about the COVID-19. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. It's my great privilege and honor to introduce our HOD, Dr. P. Sudharani, madam, who has done MSc and PhD from Sardar Patel University, Gujarat. She has contributed a lot to the Department of Biotechnology at AMC College. She has been the driving force for all the students and faculties by constantly encouraging them to fulfill their dreams. Now I request Dr. P. Sudharani, Madam, HOD, Department of Biotechnology, Administrative Management College to address the webinar. Over to you, Madam.
Are you able to hear me? Yes. Shall I continue? Yes, yes, yes. it's audible. Dr. Basu has completed her postdoctorate in molecular and cellular biology from Indian Institute of Science as a DBT fellow and her PhD studies at Indian Institute of Chemical Biology as a CSIR fellow. She has several notable publications and conference presentations in the field of science and quality management in education. She is a qualified external auditor of ISO 9001-2015. Moreover, she has done her bachelor's degree in Kathak dance and has acted in several Bengali plays which have been staged in Bangalore cultural forums. With an eye for quality in education and an artist's heart, she calls a role of her own wherever she steps in. A cheerful and an amicable leader is how her team would like to describe her as extremely hands-on and a great mentor. I welcome you, ma'am. Once again, I welcome everyone for today's webinar. Now I request Dr. Nilanjana Basu to start the session. A very good morning to all of you. I hope I am audible. Am I audible? Uh, the yes, technical team can please let me yes, know if I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're audible, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, also, I would like to see if my screen is uh, visible to all of you. So if you can just let me know if the screen is visible to all of you. Yes, ma'am. The screen is visible as well? Yes, yeah? ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay. Uh, now I've moved to the slideshow. I hope the slide is also visible. Yes, ma'am, it's clear. Yes. Okay, now so moving from the technical part to the official uh, part of the webinar today. At the very outset, I would like to thank um, Dr. Prakash, principal of uh, AMC College, and uh, the head of the department, Dr. Sudharani, for giving this opportunity uh, to address uh, students and uh, faculties of uh, this college. And it's an open uh, presentation, so it's open to everybody from outside to join in and this is a wonderful initiative to continue the learning curve through these webinar series because we do understand that uh, academics has undergone some change over the last few years um, over the last few months sorry and then uh, in that as much as we can do as an academic community to continue this learning curve every effort that we are making is going to work towards building up these uh, children who are not children, I would say these youngsters who are going to embrace the world tomorrow. There may be challenges at the uh, government level organizing exams, and we will have to wait for a nod for everything from their end. But this is a wonderful mechanism to uh, keep people attached to their field. And uh, what would happen when we were in a classroom was that. Uh, we would not get sufficient time to expose our students to a lot of path-breaking research that is happening. Probably this is a wonderful forum for us to actually introduce them to these concepts because we can actually start thinking way beyond uh, the syllabus uh, to a large extent. So coming to the topic uh, for the day, today our topic is CRISPR, the genome editing tool that can change the course of human evolution. So let us first understand what exactly oh, CRISPR is an acronym. And uh, the acronym, if you, if you want to elaborate the acronym, the, uh, it comes up as clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. And since I understand it's a scientific community over here, we will not go into very basics like what is a palindromic repeat, etc. We understand that these are repeat sequences, peculiar repeat sequences, which are present in many parts of our genome. And often these palindromic sequences play a very crucial part in the, in, organ, in the genome organization, as well as in other activities which happen inside the cell. So when we start looking at these palindromic sequences and what exactly this CRISPR does, now, these are sequences uh, which have been derived in bacteria or in prokaryotes, especially the prokaryotes which uh, are exposed to uh, difficult situations. By difficult situations, we would mean uh, prokaryotes like archaebacteria, which uh, have been found in areas which are not conducive for life. 
So those kind of bacteria, what happens is that they constantly face challenges from the environment. It could be physical challenges. It could be challenges in terms of attacks by a lot of uh, bacteriophages. So there has to be a mechanism for them to resist and survive. And uh, the ability that we have for survival, if you look at the prokaryotic world, the ability for survival is far higher. So these sequences are also called as adaptive sequences, which help the bacteria to adapt and prepare itself to fight against bacteriophage infections. And by the presence of these sequences, it is found that these bacteria can actually detect and they can destroy uh, the DNAs of bacteriophages from which it has previously received an attack. So if the bacteriophage has attacked it uh, before and it is a second round of attack that is happening, it's probably like a vaccine, it's like an immunity, okay? So the second round of an attack, the bacteria will be able to resist that kind of an attack. So in our today's presentation, we will, go, we will first introduce to you what uh, uh, CRISPR is. We've told you what CRISPR is in short, and uh, we would like to know that CRISPR is now being used as an efficient tool in genetic engineering for gene editing purpose. So how that is being used and why that is being used, we will try to understand that. We will look at the mechanism. We will also look at some applications of a research, we will try to see that. And uh, can we apply CRISPR to human genome? We will try to observe that. And are there any regulatory requirements for CRISPR? We will try to look at that, okay? So uh, uh, since the general talk, and we have different kind of people who have joined over here, we will start our talk from the basics. And we will try to understand what genetic engineering is. And when we say uh, genetic engineering, we understand the genetic engineering is a means by which we can manipulate the genome. And by manipulating the genome, we can bring about changes of the desired type in an organism, which could be plants, which could be animals, which could be human beings. So uh, the biotechnology helps you or provides you with this tool. And that tool comes from the area of genetic engineering where you can actually work on and manipulate the genes. That's in short what genetic engineering is all about. But if we look at um, uh, modifying the genome, uh, modifying the genome by means of CRISPR, CRISPR is much late in the timeline. Well before that, well, well before CRISPR came into picture, there were of course mechanisms by which we could select out the best because the purpose is we select out a disease-free organism. Purpose is we select out uh, an agricultural strain, which will not be infected very easily by um, insects, pests, etc. And the purpose is that the yield will be more. And to that yield, if we can attach something more, maybe, maybe uh, if it's a carbohydrate that it's going to produce, if we can fortify it by addition of a vitamin. So if we could do that, then it's, it's, it's something which we can utilize to our advantage. And that's where uh, bio, bio uh, engineering or we have uh, genetic engineering, which comes into picture. And if you look at this timeline or the picture that is uh, projected in front of you, uh, it, it, effect, it efficiently tells you what are uh, those timelines by which we started actually selecting. So if you look at a wolf selection for in, in, in a, uh, started much, much earlier. I mean, it, uh, especially in the 30,000 BC, we will lo look at uh, artificially select the wolves, which can best probably, uh, their, their volume of this, the sound that they make is, is very high. Then you can artificially uh, cultivate a few crops and you cannot do others. So these kind of things uh, early man would also do, but that they did not know the technology to do it. And then gradually, as we move in the timeline, uh, we see that the, the term genetic engineering, uh, was this was coined and developed by uh, Cohen and Boer. Boer and Cohen were the ones who started in as late as 1973. And then uh, there, over the few uh, years, there have been huge changes that have happened. Changes like 
many of you are uh, know of this the flavor saver tomatoes which in 1992 the u.s department of agriculture they approved it as a the first ge crop the genetic engineered crop what what happened in this crop is that in this crop you can uh, retain the uh, flavor of tomato of ripe tomato but the ripening would be delayed so that the tomatoes could be transported easily to locations which were far away then you look at um, uh, 1982 if you look at uh, hemulin hemulin is uh, the insulin which is produced in human beings it started uh, getting produced in bacteria and the purpose of uh, doing this was the release of insulin was slow by means of gen genetically in, uh, engineering this insulin the release of insulin uh, subunits were much slower so people who suffered from diabetes if you're eating your food now and the action of insulin is needed if it's a slow acting insulin for a very long time this insulin is going to show its effect and the amount of blood sugar would remain controlled for a longer time and you will not need uh, rapid shots of insulin then there were uh, then we'll come to golden rice which was carbohydrate rich variety and to this um, was deficient uh, there were many areas where it was seen that deficiency of vitamin a is observed in people and uh, these the diet that these people usually have is a carbohydrate rich diet so to that carbohydrate rich rice we could attach uh, vitamin a because vitamin a uh, deficiency had to be mitigated so then with, with the introduction of vitamin a the color of the rice changed to yellowish color and this is what we call as the golden rice and then we have thrombin anticoagulants which are being expressed in uh, goat milk so these are some of the traditional uh, traditionally what uh, genetic engineering has done so uh, past few years what it has done in the early days and what it is doing in the recent years is what has been uh, chalked down over here through this particular slide okay. so moving on to the next slide um, al almost telling us all the areas in which genetic engineering can be used you can use it in crops you can use it in industrial biotechnology you can use it for uh, medicinal purposes there are many areas that you can use it in now uh, when we look at the uh, then going forward what what exactly does it do how how exactly did we bring about these changes so if you look at the first the rules have to be set so if you have to use genetic engineering for any purpose there have to be some rules first and these rules were defined by uh, scientists in the year uh, between 1859 to 1868 we can see some of these rules were defined the origin of species mendelian inher inheritance and the nucleic acid discovery etc happened around that time and then when the rules were set there was a need for moving into from rules to a set of information that means some information on the basis of which you will be able to uh, mod manipulate a given a genome and all those information uh, we got in the form of dna as genetic material then watson crick's model of the dna structure and then nirenberg's uh, genetic code all these information were available to us by about 1967 or late 1960s and then once we had this enough information with us then the era came when uh, we started discovering the basic tools that you need in biotechnology and the basic tools that you will need in, and a very very important tool that you need in biotechnology is restriction enzyme and as you all know these restriction enzymes most of them have bacterial origin and so the the restriction enzyme discovery in 1970 was one of the path breaking areas in gen gen genome engineering or genetic engineering so that uh, we could cut the DNA and we could cut it at fixed positions, but then with, with gradual improvement in uh, genetic engineering, we could modify these restriction enzymes and we could uh, look into its cutting ability at other places, or we could have modified tools by which we could also cut uh, the genome, not just with the restriction enzymes, but with other tools. And that's what is going to be um, the crux of the talk today so uh, with all these basics that we had that means sanger's method of sequencing gradually we 
uh, started moving into new technologies in, genet in genetics and and then uh, we moved from the traditional um, the way we learn genetics to what we call as molecular genetics now and with the introduction of pcr another important tool we could actually uh, look for uh, important sequences we could actually fetch important sequences important um, areas of uh, the gene and we could utilize it for our different purposes and uh, in 2003 the path breaking human genome project another important tool for us by which we were exposed to all the different kinds of genes that are present in the human genome and uh, which are the ones where slight mutation could lead to certain diseases which are the ones which uh, work in coordination and uh, those became much more clear to us with the uh, opening of a new avenue through the human genome project but uh, we need to understand that these were just the basics and then we moved a step further if you have to look at the uh, genetic engineering there is there should be an opportunity uh, which is available to the researcher to actually edit the genome by editing we mean if you look at your uh, regular editing tools that you use in computer you often erase you often cut you often insert something you often delete something maybe that kind of a tool is needed by us if we also want to bring about a change if we want to bring about a change in the genome i need to cut a small piece which i think is not probably giving me the right kind of protein i want to remove it so i should be able to cut it so clip it and remove it is what i would like to do but maybe just removal is not what i want i want along with removal a novel character has to come so i will remove it and replace it with something else so that is where genetic editing or gene editing or genome editing finds an important role so this is basically where the areas in which genetic engineering can be used so if you look at the technology the technology remains say very very simple you have a piece of dna over here you could chop the dna with some restriction enzyme or you can create artificially you can create a dna like this which will have some sticky ends and you can have a vector vector is something with the help of which you are going to transfer these molecules into a cell so you can then allow this to be cleaved to this end that means the two ends of the vector are also sticky and you have sticky ends over here you can introduce that over here and now you have a complete vector the vector can be introduced into the cell by doing these kind of techniques not just in bacteria you can do it in viruses you can introduce foreign genes into different um, different cells you can introduce them into the eukaryotic cells also in the eukaryotic cell lines you can do ex vivo that means not inside the cell but you can do it outside the cell and then introduce those cells back into the um, eukaryotic uh, organism in which you're trying to do it or you can also target it inside by means of certain viruses which will have a natural tendency to infect these kind of eukaryotic cells so uh, genetic engineering has got some far reaching effects of not just producing uh, different uh, varieties of agricultural products it could also help in the production of vaccines it could help in uh, gene therapy that means a, a defective gene can be replaced by a copy of the good gene that you would want to be introduced into the cell uh, there can be xenotransplantation so you can have uh, some changes in the um, genome so that of, of the animals so that you can use the animal um, uh, there, there will be no rejection by the immune system and you can use the organs of these animals to be uh, to be utilized for any kind of transplantation work or you can do farming where you can have pharmaceutical products which are being expressed in uh, milk of uh, cattle etc but this technology is something which is relatively new and uh, not uh, much is discussed about it as we go through it we will realize that uh, crispr is not as new as we all think but before that let us understand what gene editing is and other than crispr is there something else which can also do gene editing why do we have to depend just on crispr there can be other things which can do this editing work also they can cut and they can insert and they can delete it could be done by others but then why will why will we employ and why will we look for a, another area or another another tool to do this 
So um, we, we have told you what uh, gene editing is. So genome editing is a, is a tool for us and it helps us uh, to bring about modifications in the genome. And these modifications uh, could be, uh, this is a technique which can be precisely and efficiently done to modify the DNA within the cell. And it invokes by making cuts at specific DNA sequences. So if there are restriction enzymes available to do specific cuts, then why will I need something else? There is really no need for me to do that. We can use some engineered nucleases to do that. Then genome editing, uh, it's also able to add and remove or alter the DNA genome. And it gives uh, the desired characteristic to the organism that you would want to look for. So for example, let's say here we are using a CRISPR, uh, a CRISPR Cas9 uh, system over here. So unlike CRISPR Cas9, there can be some other tool also, which we can use over here. So what this will do is that its main job is to bind to the DNA. So whatever we, whatever tool that we want to use, the tool first needs to make a contact with DNA because that is where the cut has to happen. So the CRISPR Cas9 can bind to the DNA over here and it can cause cuts in the DNA. This is a very preliminary slide that we are seeing. As you see more, you'll understand it better. So CRISPR-Cas9, what it does is that once bound, it can cause some insertions and deletions. It can cause cuts, double-stranded cuts. And by double-stranded cuts, it can introduce um, certain DNA molecules in its place where the cut has been introduced. By that, it can help in editing the genome. And by uh, editing it, we can use it just for the research purpose, we could do it. It can help us to get rid of a disease because if there is a disease causing gene, we can remove that by doing it. It can help to improve the yield, like we have seen in ge traditional genetic engineering. The genome editing tools also can help us in removing and inserting the desired characters. So what are those genome editing tools that we can think of? For the genome editing tools, there are multiple tools that are available. The first one is ZFN. ZFN is a, is a zinc finger nuclease. Now this is an artificial restriction enzyme. The purpose of doing this is that restriction enzymes, if we understand, have got fixed recognition sites. So they will only cut at that site. So what is done in the zinc finger nuclease to have a more global approach of uh, the nuclease cutting they are usually associated with zinc finger motifs of proteins. And these proteins, so they are protein molecules. And this protein molecule has the ability, so the protein molecule is designed, it's artificially designed, where you have the zinc finger motifs and you have the nuclease domain also. And these two domain together, will, with the zinc finger domain, you'll be able to make contact with the DNA. And the nucleus domain will be able to cause the cut. Okay, so this is how the zinc finger uh, nucleus works. Then you have uh, certain other proteins which were which were available even before CRISPR came into the picture. These are called talon. Talon is also used to a large extent now. Uh, talons are a transcription activator type effector nucleases. What do they do? They they are also engineered enzymes. Their job is with the help of the transcription activated domain, they can bind to the DNA. And with the help of the effector nucleus, that means the nucleus which is attached to it, it is able to cause a cut in the DNA. CRISPR-Cas9 also does the same thing. It can also cut the double, it can make double stranded cuts in your DNA and we will see how it can do that. But its, it's purpose is also the same. It can bind to the DNA. It can cause a double stranded cut in the DNA. Now, whenever there's a double-stranded cut in the DNA, the DNA, um, the inherent mechanism of the cell is that whenever there's an injury, it has to repair it. So for this repair purpose, whenever there is a repairing that is happening by means of non-homologous enjoining, then there are chances of either an insertion or a deletion. So whenever there's an insertion or a deletion, the gene over here will get disrupted. Whereas if we look for the homologous repair, that is homologous DNA repair, where you have another homologous strand of DNA available, on uh, using that as a template, this gap can be repaired with the homologous DNA as a template, and you can have the joining happening over here, 
by which this area can get sealed probably without an insertion deletion as well but if you can have the homologous dna which is not the homolog of this particular chromosome but it is something else over here then that will be used as a template and you will have a new set of dna added over here so you get a new dna over here as per your desired requirement so hdr repair is towards building up something whereas nj e nh ej repair will probably bring about just mutations or disruptions in your dna now this uh, gives you a cartoon of how the zinc finger um, nucleases look like these are also proteins this is zinc finger nuclease and the talon both are proteins and uh, they are dimerized proteins they have got two areas in which they will make contact with the dna and this fork one is their uh, nuclease component and these are their dna binding components okay so in talon also you have a dna binding component which is a transcription activator component and you have a fork one which is the nuclease component which is going to make the cut now how is it different from cas9 and crispr cas9 sequence crispr cas9 crispr we said is a set of palindromic sequences in the dna now crispr on its own cannot be a genetic scissor crispr needs to bind to a protein which is called cas9 and this crispr cas9 system behaves as a molecular scissor to cut your dna and this technology is an rna based technology and these are protein based technology but we have to understand that this technology also has to be created by us artificially created this also has to be artificially created by us because if we are depending on the natural methods of cutting then we will have to depend upon the restriction enzyme but restriction enzyme can only cut it at fixed areas it will not do the job as you desire so if it has to be as you desire then you have to engineer a protein or you have to engineer a rna engineering a protein is a difficult task it takes longer time to engineer protein much more complicated but engineering an rna using the crispr system is sufficiently easier method for us and why is it easier let us look at it this is how talon uh, does its job i've already explained to you so i'll skip this slide okay there is one more tool which can also do this job that that kind of a question should also come in our mind especially people who are uh, molecular biologists over here or people who are uh, who have studied rnai technology now this is another question which can come to our mind that if it is an rna based technology then why not rnai rnai can also do that now the purpose of the genetic engineering in the beginning we have told is that we have to remove a gene and insert a gene that's our requirement requirement the first the second requirement so if we have to look at these two requirements rnai should be able to do that but what rnai will do and what a rnai is many of you will know but for some of you who do not know just a small introduction of what what a rnai can do is that these are inhibitory rna molecules and what rnai can do is that uh, usually double stranded rnai can be produced in your cell also as uh, from the uh, pre mirnas that are present in the nucleus or a double stranded rna can enter into the cell get converted into a single stranded rna and this single stranded rna can then be incorporated into this structure which is a protein structure along with the rna and this is called as the risk complex risc or the rna induced silencing complex these are usually made up of the single stranded rna which is produced from the double stranded rna which has entered the cell now this single stranded rna in the risk complex its ability is to go and bind to an mrna so what it would do is that it probably is not going to knock out my gene it is only going to interfere with the rna with the mrna 
and prevent the mRNA transcription, the translation of the mRNA to happen. So it is going to prevent my protein production, but it will not knock out my gene. So what RNAi usually does, so if I want to remove a gene, I may not be able to always depend upon RNAi because its job is to prevent the translation, but not to do anything at the DNA level. DNA is going to stay intact. It is going to bind with the mRNA and stop the translation of mRNA. Sometimes if the binding is not as much as a complete complementarity, I may have a situation like this. So when we have situation like this, translation will not get inhibited completely. We can have a few translated molecules at that time. So that means RNAi can help in knocking down or bringing down the amount of translation, the amount of protein production, the protein which we don't want in the cell, but it is not necessary that it will be able to stop it all the time. So we will have to look for a mechanism by which a knockout can be done. And for knockout, CRISPR is one of those techniques. So what is CRISPR? Let us see what CRISPR is. Now CRISPR is a genomic tool. It has got two components in it. There is a guide RNA component because it's an RNA tool. Of course, RNA is very important. It has a guide RNA component. And it has a protein which is called as Cas protein. Cas the name comes from CRISPR-associated proteins, so Cas protein, CRISPR-associated endonuclease. Now, this guide RNA's job is like a GPS system. It's going to take the Cas protein to the right place. The job will be done by the Cas protein. Cas protein is your nuclease. Cas protein will, be ha will have the ability to cut. But how will the Cas protein know where it has to go and cut? The guide RNA has to do the job, okay? So CRISPR system, when we talk about, we cannot isolate CRISPR from Cas. It is called as a CRISPR-Cas9 system. Cas9, and why Cas9? Because there are many Cas proteins available. Cas9 is the simplest of all, so we look at the Cas9. Cas9, it is possible for us to produce and um, isolate from uh, some organisms. The most commonly used nuclease that we can think of is the streptococcus pyogenes, this, the Cas9 produced from here. This is commercially utilized by us uh, more efficiently. And uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system, it contains the, so if, if we have to look at this Cas9 molecule now, which has to do the uh, nuclease activity, how, the, how, how is the Cas9 molecule? Let us understand the Cas9 nuclease has got two protein lobes. What are the two lobes? One is the recognition lobe, that means a lobe which will help in the recognition, but we said the RNA does the recognition. So why will Cas9 do the recognition now? RNA gets integrated into Cas9 to form a complex and the lobe of Cas9 with which the RNA binds, that is called as the recognition lobe, that particular lobe will be responsible to recognize the DNA sequence, the target DNA sequence where the cut has to be done. And the nuclease lobe will be responsible to cause the double-stranded break in the target DNA. Okay. Now, once the double-stranded break has happened, we have already explained to you what NHEJ is and what HDR is. NHEJ is a quick fix repair system. So whenever there's a break, it'll have a tendency to anneal it. And while annealing, there may be either a loss or there, there may be again, so insertion, deletion, mutations, or indels, we will be able to see. But in HDR, it is a more thought, thought after process by the cell. So the cell has to use some template. And if for, for that matter, if the template you can give as the gene of your choice, then that template can get integrated into the genome. So this kind of a gene editing, now what we, shortly understood about CRISPR can uh, be done in somatic cells. They can be done in germline cells also. Somatic cells, we mean cells which, which give rise to another cell in your body. Germline cells are those cells which are responsible for generation of the, for, the, for moving from one generation to the other. 
So next generation uh, is done by through these germline uh, things. But if you really look at the germline gene editing, we still don't have a nod for the germline gene editing. And the germline gene editing would mean, let's say you want to remove this DNA piece with the red piece with the blue piece. You're cutting it with the help of Casper Cas9 system, as you're doing it with the help of a CRISPR Cas9 system. And this blue one is getting uh, integrated. But whatever change you bring about over here, this is done in the germline. That means the gametic cell cells, which will produce the gamete. So from the gamete, you will have the next generation or the new generation. So all the change that you are going to bring about over here will move on to the next generation as well. But if you do the similar change in the somatic cell, that means the cell which is moving around in your body and not responsible for production of the next generation, they are not the gametes. There, you're introducing this blue counterpart. It's going to stay in the cells in which you have made. You have made a change in the blood cell. It's going to stay in the edited blood cell. It's not going to move to your liver cells. It's going to stay over here. So here, the other cells will remain unaffected. So you can have a targeted um, change that you would like to make over here. Other cells will remain intact. But in this case, whatever change you make, it has to move on to the next generation. Okay. So this is a technology which is still debatable. There are ethical issues. There are legal and societal considerations uh, for allowing germline gene editing. But somatic gene editing is possible because you, you can. You can bring about a change and you can, you can uh, work with it. It's, it's far easier to do this because it is not going to move to the next generation. So permissions for doing this kind of work uh, will be achieved faster. Okay. Now coming back to CRISPR and the discovery of CRISPR, and all of us need to understand that CRISPR, there is a lot of controversy over who has discovered CRISPR. When did, when did the discovery of CRISPR happen? Because if we say that these sequences were present in bacteria, they were anyway present in bacteria, then where is the question of finding a new technology and going for patent of a new technology? Of course, CRISPR has been patented by uh, Jennifer Judain and group. Uh, the purpose of uh, that was they have not, uh, the patent is for the technology. The technology of CRISPR has been patented. The utilization of CRISPR to bring about modifications in different eukaryotic cells, that technology has been patented. But what CRISPR is? If you look at 1987, the first report of CRISPR as clustered repeats, these were, this was made by in Ishiano's paper in 1987. And in 2000, as we moved on, uh, we see that the recognition of CRISPR families present throughout in the prokaryotic world was done by Mojica in this, um, 2000 in this year, Mojica and team this, did this discovery. And then there was this, the, the term CRISPR was coined. So if you really look at the word CRISPR, you can't say that we will be able to um, patent CRISPR in the year 2012 or 2013, because the term was coined in the year 2002. So there are, of course, a lot of controversies over here. Then in 2005, uh, the identified foreign origin spaces. There are some spacer sequences in CRISPR. We will, we will look into that. That was identified in 2005, 2007. The experiments uh, to prove that this CRISPR gives immunity to the bacterial cell was identified in 2007, 2008. CRISPR acts on the DNA targets was identified 2008. The kind of complex that CRISPR forms with Cas9 was identified in 2010. Cas9 is getting guided by uh, some spacer sequences which can cleave the DNA that was identified and it goes on and on like that. But in the year 2012, this is around the time when uh, CRISPR has been able to, it was possible uh, to actually show that CRISPR could be taken outside from the prokaryotic cells it could be taken to eukaryotic cells. And in eukaryotic cells, it could adapt uh, to the genome editing system that was present in the eukaryotic cells. We could harness this from a prokaryotic cell, take it to a eukaryotic cell, and see whether this can bring about the change. So this was done by Jennifer Dudna. She, she's the one who's actually 
uh, given the credit and the patent by the USPTO, that's the United States Patent Organization. They have given her the patent, not just one patent, she's got two patents for uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And they have looked into the CRISPR-Cas9 expression in the human cells. They have also tried to find out uh, from the Cas9 um, protein, which is that component of the Cas9 protein, which is actually responsible for cutting or causing the nick or the cut in the uh, DNA. So uh, Jennifer uh, Diudna had got some other uh, counterparts. She had her teammates, um, Charpentier and Feng Zhang. These are the people who were worked who worked together in uh, in different areas of the United States. Some in Berkeley, some in and uh, they were working in MIT and Harvard. So all of them together uh, got the patent in the year. Of course, there are some controversies and the Eastern world also claims um, some credit to it. But uh, by, by the time that this happened, this was in the year 2012 when uh, Charpenter and uh, Judna and colleagues, and they found out that this was, it was possible to use CRISPR as a genetic engineering tool. And after that, there was a kind of explosion. So from 2002 to 2013, a steady improvement, a steady timeline of CRISPR we can see in the discovery of CRISPR or invention of CRISPR. But after this, there was an explosion of CRISPR. That means CRISPR was applied to almost every area. So if you can think of a technology which has the potential of engineering eukaryotic cells, that technology was adopted by several labs all over the world to bring about these kind of changes. And these changes were brought about in human beings, in C. elegans, in yeast. So there were a lot of manipulation of the genome that was happening. There were manipulations that happened in mice, manipulations in the Drosophila genome. Then there were manipulations in the C. elegans. There were manipulations done in the a genome of livestock, there were manipulations done in Xenopus, several manipulations in, the, uh, in one year. You can look at several months. All these months that you are displayed over here, they actually tell you how in every month we could see that one group or the other is actually utilizing this technology in uh, bringing about some change. So um, in the year 1987, actually, uh, when we said that CRISPR was first invented, there was a paper on this nucleotide sequence of IAP gene. This paper was by Osaka University, and that is where the Eastern world also claims um, some ownership to CRISPR, because this paper was the first paper in the, in the if you look at uh, the discussion of this paper, the discussion paragraph of this paper, there are few things that the paper says. One is, that next to this IAP sequence, it was not a characterized sequence, but interestingly, there was a family of homologous sequences which was identified, and these were arranged as direct repeats, and there was a spacing between these nucleotides. So there were 29 nucleotide repeats with a 32 nucleotide spacing in between them, and this particular sequence so far, no sequence homologous to this has been found elsewhere in the prokaryotic world. So in the year 1987, though CRISPR was identified in the paper, it was clearly, the term was not coined, of course, uh, but the researchers had identified something like this in the year 1987. And this is how basically science happens. Science always happens by chance. So when you're doing some other work, you chance upon something and then some other group takes it up and then they work on it. And that's how science goes on. Okay, now coming back to the CRISPR technology, we said that um, in the, when we were looking at the definition, we said that these are sequences present in the uh, bacteria. And these are sequences derived by the bacteria from a previous bacteriophage infection. And we said it is like a vaccine, that means this bacteriophage is infected and I have derived something from this bacteria. Next time the bacteria is going, the bacteriophage is going to infect the bacterial cell, the bacteria is going to resist this infection. So this is a method of adaptive immunity. So if the viral genome is entering, somehow this viral genome is getting integrated 
into the DNA of the bacteria and that is providing some immunity to it and by immunity here we mean next time there is an infection this bacterial genome is doing something we did not know what thing at that time it's causing a double stranded cut and it is allowing the survival of the bacteria okay so that's an immune adaptive immune mechanism of the bacteria and let us see what actually happens by this uh, crispr cas9 system what basically happens is that you have the uh, bacteriophage over here the bacteriophage has a genome and many of us know over here that this genome will get uh, the bacteriophage will allow uh, this genome to enter into the bacterial cell and if you can look at this red color over here this maroon color dna which is of the genomic material which is coming from the bacteriophage this is uh, foreign to the cell and the blue color part the blue color genome is the host genome okay now this is how the host genome is in the host genome we have learned now that prokaryotic cells typically have a repeat sequence this r r r r are repeat sequences and in between the repeat sequences there were some spacers s1 s2 s3 these are the spacers so what this will do is that this is going to create another spacer which is now called as s0 and get integrated into the host genome okay and they'll stay like this there's no role to play it's going to stay like that so it is just creating a new spacer over here within the palindromic sequence that was existing in the dna of the host now in prokaryotes of course you have a, a, a mrna like this polycystronic mrna is being produced like this and this is called as the pre cr rna or the pre crispr rna so this complete rna will be produced from this dna sequence like this because you have palindromic repeats over here wherever the r is there you are going to see this kind of a structure okay the hairpin kind of a structure now what happens over here not known by then but by now we know what happens uh, this rna would get cleaved into smaller components and how it does that is that there is another rna molecule which is called as tracer rna which is not within this operon it is further up in the five stream area and that rna tends to bind with this region causing double stranded rna pieces but that rna is not a big rna so it's going to bind over here it's going to bind here it's going to bind here it's going to bind here so it's going to give small stretches of double stranded rnas and whenever we have these double stranded rnas the rnas h of the system is going to cleave recognize the double stranded rna cleave the double stranded rna and form structures which are individual these individual molecules will now be called as the crispr rna molecules it was called as pre crispr before this now after processing it will be called as crispr rnas this crispr rna is going to enter into a cas9 and now it's going to become a complex which can actually cause a cut okay prokaryotic cell it would, would look like stage one the foreign dna is entering foreign dna is getting over here so now you have these palindromes in black and these red ones are the spacer so a new spacer red color is getting created other spaces have been created before so now you have the pre cr rna and everywhere you see a different color over here because they are formed from these and then now the processing is going to happen so the rna is 3 is going to cut it into these molecules they are all going to enter into different uh, the crispr associated proteins or in this case maybe cas9 and once i get an infection by this bacteriophage with a different genome over here shown by green then this one is going to work as an immunity against this if it is another bacteriophage at a later point in time denoted by this yellow Uh, genome then this particular one is going to show the immunity because of this i will see the immunity not because of the others 
in this case, I will see the immunity because of this and not because of the others. So that's where it gives a vast range of immunity to these prokaryotic systems for survival in these environments. Now looking at the genome of CRISPR, this is where the repeat sequences are. These are the repeat sequences. This is where the spacers have been created by the virus as it has entered and its genome has got integrated. Upstream to this, there is another operon called the Cas operon, where you have this Cas9 kind of genes present. There are many other proteins also other than Cas9, but Cas9 is also one of them. And then upstream to that, I said there is one more RNA sequence, which is called as tracer RNA. The spelling of tracer here is T-R-A-C-R and not T-R-A-C-E-R. This particular RNA is the one which is vital because this RNA is needed along with your pre-CR RNA to form that double-stranded RNA and thus forming a cut. Without that, the RNA spree will not be able to recognize, okay? So this tracer RNA is over here, and from here we get that tracer RNA sequence. So now looking at the genome sequence over here, if you look at the region over here, these are the CRISPR repeats, and these are the spacer sequences. So there is a CRISPR repeat followed by a spacer, and then there's a CRISPR repeat followed by another spacer, like that it happens. And the spacers will differ from uh, one virus to the other because each virus is going to introduce a different spacer. So these originate from the virus, and this is the CRISPR repeat, okay? Now what the CRISPR-Cas9 will do? Now let us say this is your signal sequence which has come from the spacer, the spacer, spacer area. So for the spacer area, you have got this guide sequence. This guide sequence is definitely having similarity to the virus because this has been derived from the virus before. So the guide sequence can easily be directed because it is an RNA, it will have a uracil over here, this is DNA. So this guide sequence will have complementarity with the viral genome because this uh, has been derived from the spacer and this spacer sequence can come and bind to this complementary region of the DNA and this is where it is going to form a base pair. And this is how the base pairing will happen. And when the base pairing happens, Cas9, we said, has a recognition motive. It has a nuclease motive. So the nuclease motive is, the recognition part is done. Now the nuclease motive is going to cause a cut here and a, and a cut here. So there are double-stranded cuts over here and a new genome can be inserted into this. This is called as a CRISPR-Cas9 genome cutting or the nuclease system that will be utilized by the prokaryote to cause any kind of disruption in the viral genome. Imagine this to be the viral genome, and this is, that is present inside the bacterial cell. So this kind of cutting of the viral genome can happen. So once it cuts, what are the kind of changes it can bring about? It can bring about, uh, if the moment there's a cut, it can bring about uh, a substitution. That means in place of G over here, you can have A amino acid. So as you can have A nucleotide, and the amino acid glutamine over here will get changed to lysine. So you can have a substitution at a single point and amino acid can undergo a change. You can have some frame shift mutations also, wherein you are going to have one insertion. That means CTT was present over here. The CTT is going to shift and you're going to have an insertion of one C residue over here. And it's going to change the entire frame of reading and you are going to have glycine, arginine, et cetera, in place of glutamine, glutamine. And then you can have a deletion also. The deletion also could bring about some frame shift and thus a mutation or disruption. And then you can have a threonine, lysine, and arginine in place of tyrosine and glutamine by causing an, a deletion. So one uh, has, A has got deleted. So now you, the codon will become TGC instead of ATG. So you will have a new amino acid over here. So CRISPR-Cas9 can cause gene corrections. That means with the double-stranded break, what can happen is that gene disruption can happen by insertion deletion. You can have gene correction by the HDR method. You can have a gene correction. You can also have insertion of a chunk of DNA, which we said, where the HDR technology can be along, can be, we can co-transfect our gene of choice into the cell. And so this, will, this part will be available. 
So this will be used as a template. And since it is being used as a template, this can be inserted over here. And by the HDR repair mechanism, we can have a gene insertion over here also. Now, looking at um, the CRISPR system in detail, what exactly would happen, let us understand, that uh, from this area of, we said Cas operon is present upstream from the CRISPR region, we are going to have the Cas9 um, uh, protein over here. And uh, from this CRISPR sequence, we are going to get the repeats and we are going to get the spacer. So the repeats and the spacer will help us to organize this. So from here, I am getting this RNA, the CR RNA that is available. And I'm getting the tracer RNA, which is a double-stranded RNA. And once it was double-stranded from the mRNA transcript, it has been cut. And this is what I had, okay? So when I had this, there was a, there was a sequence which was derived from the virus, the green sequence. This is going to have homology with the viral genome. This is the viral genome or the target genome, which has to be cut. So in the viral genome, this green area and this green area, they are base pairing, allowing my CRISPR-Cas9 system to go and bind over there without any external help, just the internally, this thing is happening. So this sequence is present. This sequence is helping for the recognition process. And the tracer sequence was there, which helped in cutting off the uh, sequence from the big polycystronic mRNA that we had. And then this is getting integrated into this Cas9. This part is taking care of my recognition. And Cas9 is going to take care of my nuclease action. It is going to cause double-stranded cuts at these regions. Double-stranded cuts exactly right opposite to each other. So you have blunt-ended double-stranded cuts. And this position where the binding has to happen or the nucleus digestion has to happen is recognized by another sequence which is called as PAM sequence which is present on the uh, viral genome or the, or the target genome in which you have to actually cause the cut. So th this is um, how the CRISPR looks like. This is how the mRNA gets uh, pre, see, um, the pre, the CRISPR RNA is. And this is how the tracer RNAs, as I said, they will go and bind to different areas and they are going to form the double-stranded RNA and then the cut by RNAs H. And then the Cas9 is going to come and join over here. So you are going to get structures like this. So this structure is going to go and target it to the genome. And once targeted, it's going to cause a cut and this genome will get cut into two pieces. So this is a bigger picture for you to look at how this uh, integration happens with Cas9. And uh, this is where the RNA age cutting is happening. And uh, this is how it enters into the target DNA. And once it is in the target DNA, it recognizes a PAM sequence where it has to cause the cut. The moment it causes the cut over here, there are two domains to cause the cut. One is called as the H and H domain, which causes cut in the target uh, DNA strand. And the other DNA strand gets cut by the RUV compartment or RUV component of the protein. And then there is a double-stranded cleavage and your target DNA gets cleaved or broken. And then you can insert something of your choice. Two different types of um, classes of our uh, CRISPR. Class one is a very, very complicated class where there are multiple proteins which have to come together to give rise to this activity. And we will not get into the detail of the structure. Class two uh, is a simpler structure of which uh, the type two, type five, and type six come under class two. Type six can cause single standard cleavages. Type one and type five are the ones which are of importance to us because they can cause the double stranded DNA cleavages. So if you look at this um, picture, you will see this is the type two, this is the type five, and this is the type five A and five B. Five A ruled out because five A does not have uh, another, does not need another RNA to do the activity. So you can, it can act on its own. It's a self-processing uh, enzyme. The tracer RNA is not needed, but the tracer RNA is needed for type 2 and type 5B. In type 
Type 5B, you will see the cuts that are produced are not at locations which are right opposite to each other. So it will not cause a blunt ended cut. Most of the time we will require that blunt ended cut to allow HDR repair to set in. So we will only target our discussion on the basis of Cas9 and Cas9 comes from type 2 of CRISPR. Type 2 CRISPR has Cas9 present in its Cas operon area and this Cas9 is responsible for formation of this particular protein complex. So we will only uh, target our discussion over here. It's the simplest one to look at and this is one which has been harnessed mostly for the genetic engineering purposes um, that we can that we will discuss subsequently. So uh, if you look at this how the Cas9 CRISPR protein looks like this is a bigger picture this is the guide RNA, the guide RNA that is present over here. This is the sequence which is from the spacer sequence. The spacer sequence will have complementarity with one of the strands of the DNA from the virus. And these are the nucleus domains of the protein which are causing the cut. And this is the PAM sequence which helps in the recognition. That means there may be many such sequences present. But to all sequences, the binding may happen. Cutting will not happen. Cutting will only happen when the spam sequence is present. And what is the spam sequence? Let us understand. So this is where the this kind of a sequence called as any nucleotide and two Gs have to be present over here. That's called as a PAM sequence in the target DNA where the binding has to happen. And this sequence of the virus which is similar to the spacer. Spacer was created in the bacterial genome from the viral genome. So this sequence in the viral genome, which has complementarity with the spacer sequence, has been identified and termed as protospacer sequence. There may be many protospacer sequences, but a protospacer sequence can only target a cut, provided there is a PAM sequence next to it. If PAM is not present and three nucleotides before PAM is where the cut has to happen. So we need to understand two things over here. This is uh, the HDR mechanism and the N uh, NHEJ. I will not get into this detail once again. We already know this. But um, what we will see over here is that what is the PAM sequence and what is sgRNA? Now sgRNA, we said that there are two RNAs. One is tracer RNA that is needed and one is guide RNA that is needed. Now, if we have to manipulate this tool, if we have to use this tool, every time I cannot introduce two different RNAs into the cell. So what is done is that a custom designed RNA can be used, which is a single RNA, which will have the CRRNA sequence, and it will also have the tracer RNA sequence. And this was called as the guide sequence. This is the signaling sequence. So together it will call, together it will be called as the single guide RNA or sgRNA. That means when we said that, uh, we will go back to this picture, when we said that a tracer RNA and a cgRNA, crRNA together is needed to form my cutting device, every time I will not be able to give these two separately. If these two are separately present, then also I will be able to produce the cut. But if I can customize it and if I can join them together by some means and I call them now as sgRNA, then these can be used as molecular tools in other systems as well. So that's what is an sgRNA. PAM sequence is uh, the DNA target sequence must have a protospacer adjacent motive to the PAM. So PAM sequence is the NGG sequence. The 20 nucleotide upstream sequence to PAM is called as the protospacer. And three nucleotides before PAM is the sequence where the cutting is actually going to happen. Okay, so PAM is not part of your sgRNA recognition sequence. PAM is absolutely separate. PAM sequence, if you see, is absolutely separate. sgRNA is this RNA which will cause the recognition and cause the cut. But PAM is essential for this nucleus cutting to happen. Okay. So three nucleotides just before PAM is where the cut is going to happen. So if we have to use this as a molecular tool, if I have to 
kind, which is going to have H and H domain. It's going to have the R R U V C domain, and it is going. To, it should have the PAM domain. Plus, this linker loop should be there so that the S G R N A can be formed, and I don't need these separately. This structure will be my molecular two. There will be an R E C loop. There will be for recognition or binding to the DNA. There will be a nuclease lobe which will be able to cut, and in my nuclease lobe, I will have two different regions: H and H region and the R U V C region. H and H region to cut the target uh, DNA, the target strand, and the non-target strand to be cut by the R U V C. So, looking at the structure of uh, this, this exocrystallographic structure, the structure would look like this. This is this is basically a, a model. This is not the real structure. The model says that there is a recognition sequence. Target recognition will happen by this. This is the PAM binding sequence in the uh, Cas9. This is where your H and H domain is. That is, it is going to bind to the target DNA. And this gray region is going to bind the RUV sequence, which is going to bind to the RUV region, which is going to bind to the non-target DNA. This is the extra crystallographic structure. So to this sequence, the REC loop, the DNA has to bind, and this, the target DNA must bind. This is the non-target DNA bind binding, so which means this has to move over here. If this is where my DNA must bind, and this is the cutting domain, and this has to gain access to the target uh, DNA, which is act actually causing the binding between the sgRNA and uh, the molecule over here the cas9 molecule that means this must undergo a change that means this is not the actual conformation that we see in a bound state we all have to understand that the that the cutting of the dna if we are looking for this tool to cut a new karyotic dna it's highly packaged so there has to be a negligible change so the protein should be able to change on its own because the dna cannot change it is a highly packaged structure so if you look at the extra crystallographic structure of a bound uh, molecule, you will see the yellow structure, which is actually your H and H domain, has shifted from this position to this position. So this DNA, the protein undergoes conformational change to make sure that it is able to access the DNA because the DNA cannot really make a lot of conformational change over here. The change in the DNA, opening up of the DNA from its protein necessarily will not happen because it is a highly packaged DNA in the eukaryotic cell. So because we have this domain which is freely acting and it can come closer to it, so it is possible for us to use this as a uh, molecular scissor to cut the DNA. So how these experiments were proved? There were some resonance experiments which were done, fluorescence resonance uh, techniques were done, these fluorescence resonance energy transfer in which you had uh, the two different fluorescent tags, the green tag and the red tag. And when these tags come very close to each other, there's a different kind of fluorescence. They will emanate. And uh, when they are farther apart, they will allow the green and the red to fluoresce on, its, on their own. So you have the H and H domain over here. And to this H and H domain, when, whenever the, the double-stranded DNA is coming and binding, so you have the signal sgRNA, which is bound to the Cas9. This is your CRISPR-Cas9 structure. When the DNA comes and binds, the DNA must bind to this domain because this is the uh, domain uh, where the binding has to happen. In the Cas9, the DNA comes over here, the binding happens, and then there is a change in the fluorescence. The fluorescence resonance automatically changes, and since the fluorescence is stacked to H and H, it proves that maybe the H and H has been able to come and move over here to cause this change in the resonance of the. Um, uh, the fluorescing molecules present over here. Okay, but it could also happen that this uh, this uh, domain moves, but that has been proved by the extra crystallographic studies which have been done. So how will, um, is there anything else which we need to know over here? There's something else that we need to know. These are called the anti-CRISPR molecules. And these anti-CRISPR molecules are those molecules which help uh, or, or which prevent the CRISPR molecules to attack because many times in spite of this immunity, we see bacteriophages are able to attack cells. So there are some anti-CRISPR molecules which are produced by the cell itself 
and these anti-CRISPR molecules which are being produced by the bacteriophage, what they do is that they tend to stop the Cas9 system present in the host. So if this is the bacterial host and this is my bacteriophage, which has to try and gain an entry now, it's going to produce the anti-CRISPR. The anti-CRISPR is going to inhibit the CRISPR system. So how does it inhibit the CRISPR system? Does it prevent the DNA binding? Does it prevent the DNA cutting of the CRISPR system? What does it do if we want to look at it? There were some experiments which were, which were done by this um, group which actually patented it. And the, in the experiment, what they did is that the double-stranded DNA was radio-labeled. So if uh, the double-stranded DNA is getting cut, that means there is no anti-CRISPR, your uh, your radioactivity, which was supposed to be in in this uh, DNA, now since it is cut, the radioactivity is distributed in the smaller fragment. Also, you are going to see the radioactivity. So the radioactivity is somewhat like this. So you see in the smaller fragment also and the larger fragment also. A larger fragment in the beginning, and gradually the radioactivity shifts to the smaller fragment. You see negligible residual radioactivity over here. But if you have the anti-CRISPR molecule, you do not see the cutting over here. So you don't see the small fragment in which the radioactivity should be seen. You only see the radioactivity in the larger fragment, which means the cutting has not happened. So where did the cutting stop? Did the cutting stop at the binding level or at the cutting level? Because there are two things that the Cas9 does, bind as well as cuts. So there are different um, uh, uh, these constructs that you can prepare. And uh, when you look at the constructs and you try to uh, understand this, uh, with an anti-CRISPR, you will see over here the function is more or less same. So you have the CRISPR and you have the DNA and it's causing the cut and the, the uh, radioactivity is shifting into the smaller molecules. And in this, we said that radioactivity is not going to shift. But what interestingly we saw is that, uh, the group saw is that uh, the radioactivity shifted to an area which is over here, which is much higher in size. That means binding was happening so this DNA got integrated into this structure. The binding was happening. It became a relatively larger molecule, but the cutting was not happening in it. So this H and H domain, which is responsible for cutting, the, the anti-CRISPR molecule actually interacts with this. It does not interact with the other domains which are responsible for binding to the DNA. And once this uh, H and H domain uh, does not allow one cut to happen, if the single cut does not happen, the other cut will also not happen. So this is going to finally inactivate this entire CRISPR-Cas9 molecule. And why did they do these experiments? Because they, what they tried to do is that by doing that, they tried to see if it is possible to create new CRISPR molecules, which are called as crispr nikase These crispr nikase are those molecules where now we have understood that each of the counterparts have separate actions. So we are capable of mutating one component and retaining the activity of the other. So that one component can cause the cut and the other component will not cause the cut and you are going to have single-stranded cuts in the DNA instead of a double-stranded cut. And the purpose of doing that is that if you can have two such molecules, you can have staggered cuts. So you can have one cut over here, you can have one cut over here and you can generate a DNA molecule with sticky ends. You will not generate DNA molecules only with blunt ends. So you can have a far wider use of Cas9 in place of just a one kind of Cas9 where you can have only blunt ended cuts. Or you can have some Cas9s where both the nicking properties are removed. That means you are going to mutate the HNH, you are going to mutate the RUVC, you're going to mutate both these counterparts and you are going to just have a, a domain which is capable of attaching itself to the DNA to the target DNA but not causing a cut what will be of uh, what will be the use of that those will be used as effector molecules so you can bind to them some transcription activators and repressors to a to any kind of target human genome sequence over here you can allow the binding to happen over here no cutting simply binding the effector molecule can either activate or repress the downstream gene over here. So this is another utility for which uh, Cas9 could be used. So Cas9 could be used as an editing tool. It could regulate gene expression. It could also attach a GFP molecule and help in the genoming, uh, genome imaging uh, activity could also be possible. So 
the CRISPR toolbox can be many and it can uh, do a lot of activities. So how this entry will happen into a regular cell, any, like any other uh, gene which, can, which has to get introduced, you can do it by means of some vectors, you can do transfection, you can do conjugations, you can do transformation, you can do transduction, you can do different things, preferably. In a eukaryotic cell, if you do viral mediated methods, the delivery will be far better. So you can introduce the Cas9 and um, the guide RNA or the sgRNA as a separate uh, uh, this plasmid, and you can introduce the gene of your choice as a separate plasmid. So this, the job of this is going to cause a cut. So both are going to enter into your cell. This is going to cause the cut over here, and because this is present, this molecule will get integrated over here, and you are going to have this LRKK molecule over here, LRRK gene introduced and it will give rise to a new phenotype which can be screened and it can be uh, isolated. We are not looking into the screening tools at all because we are only concentrating on the molecular biology of Cas9 over here. This is uh, for that matter another one where you can actually see a GFP fluorescence and you will be able to identify. So this is your host gene and in this gene you are going to edit. So you can have one plasmid in which you have the Cas gene and the target, uh, the the gRNA sequence over here, the target sequence, which has to be just recognized over here. So these two in the form of one plasmid. And in another plasmid, you are going to have the GFP, where the fluorescence is going to be seen, or you can have the puromycin resistance. So you can have that gene also under the PGK promoter. So the purpose is to introduce this, which is, which is new to your uh, genome. And this introduction is going to happen with the help of these two. So this and this will be co-transfected into your cell. And because this is present, the cutting can happen. And because the cutting has happened, now this is the template which will be used. And against this template, this introduction will happen. And you are going to see a new uh, gene introduced. And you're going to recognize that with the help of the screening tools because GFP is there and puromycin resistance is there. This kind of an editing, of course, can be done in the germline also. You can do that in the egg cells also. You can introduce that by means of microinjection techniques. Any technique that, that we follow for uh, gene delivery can also be followed over here for introducing it into the genome. Now, Casper Cas9 is a very efficient tool. It's a versatile tool. It can, can be targeted anywhere. You, can, you just have to uh, design this into your vector, into this. You just have to design this over here. And you can actually target it anywhere into the cell. So it's a very easy tool. And uh, it, it's easily adaptable. It's an RNA level change that you need to do. It's not a protein level work at all. Um, it's highly specific. Toxicity is very, very low. Delivery can be done efficiently, like any other gene transfer method that you do. By doing this, you can introduce uh, it in the foreign genes into bacteria, into fungi, into animal cells, into plants. Almost everywhere, you could all, you could introduce them. So some of the work which has been done by uh, teams which have already started doing their work, this is a US team which has done this kind of work. And this um, work which was done by the US team is in uh, form of uh, the tomato. In tomato, you see, um, when we started domesticating tomato, uh, we found that in the domestic tomato, the, it was needed that the branch is not, um, is, is, is a little soft because we, we cannot have longer trees. So we need to have a little softer branches because the size of the plant is small. But in these softer branches, what started happening is that a lot of flowers started growing in them. And when a lot of flowers are there, the, the weight of the, uh, the tomatoes were too heavy and the, uh, and the, and the uh, plants could not survive for long. And it was very difficult to separate out these genes, the gene responsible for producing large number of flowers and the gene responsible for the soft stem. It was not possible to separate them out by the traditional uh, breeding experiments that were being done. So what was done is that these were linked genes, and that's how the epistasis was seen in them. In this epistasis, uh, that linked genes could be easily, one of the genes could be removed so that multiple uh, floral gene could be easily knocked out by using CRISPR-Cas9, and uh, that kind of a, um, work was done in tomatoes. Then in HIV, the HIV proviruses, uh, could be cut in precise manner so that HIV could not be packaged into the, uh, the coats and the coat protein could not package it because the HIV which got integrated and once it came out as a provirus in this provirus stage itself, uh, the cutting could happen in the DNA and if the cutting happened, this HIV could be excised out. Now, uh, 
but this kind of a research uh, requires a lot of human trial. It's un unlike this tomato research. So here it has to pass through a lot of human trials before HIV can actually see the light or this uh, Cas9 tool in HIV can see the light of the day. A lot of um, regulatory guidelines it has to go through. And uh, we, we, we will subsequently see in the next slide that uh, there are Chinese groups which have started doing this because we'll just take you to that because uh, what happens is that uh, in China, there was a, there is a scientist who has done this, it's called the Jian Kui. He did this experiment in secrecy and he uh, tried to modify uh, this gene in uh, a patient who was a career HIV. And he edited the genes in the twins of the mother and he implanted these twins into the mother and when the twins were born, he expected that the twins will not have HIV because the mother was carrier. There was a chance that the twins, the children born out of the mother could actually be HIV positive. So to do that, he actually did this experiment and he did the experiment in secrecy with the CCR5 gene, uh, which will offer some resistance to HIV. He manipulated this gene using the genome editing tool using Cas9. And uh, what finally happened is that there was one normal copy and only one copy could be edited. So it existed in the heterozygous condition. So we really do not know whether the children who were, the children who were there, they are not free of HIV. They are still the carrier. And of, and of course, not all the cells he could target and do it. So uh, it was a mosaic which was created. So some cells of the children uh, could actually, um, get HIV infection any point in time. So these are dangerous tools that we are using until we get the, uh, get, you know, till it passes through all kinds of guidelines, it's not necessarily the tool that, necessarily a tool that we can use uh, in uh, editing. So um, uh, to, uh, to go back, uh, this kind of an experiment uh, at the ex vivo level, that means manipulating it outside this um, organism, has also been done in beta thalassemia, in beta thalassemia, the beta counterpart is abnormal in the hemoglobin. The alpha counterpart remains functional. The beta thalassemia can be, um, in thalassemia, the beta counterpart can be removed and it can be compensated by the alpha from the fetal blood. So the fetal blood can, you know, so, that the, so that the organism can survive in spite of um, the thalassemia. He will not need regular blood uh, transmissions, uh, transfusions to happen so that the replacement with a fetal um, blood can happen. And this has actually been done. This experiment has been done. And uh, we, are wait we are waiting for uh, the nod so that it's, it can be tried out in humans. They have also been tried out in humans in Europe in, because in Europe, we don't have too much of uh, these restrictions now. And um, in Europe, it has been done in uh, Germany by the company called as CRISPR Therapeutics. So this company has uh, done this experiment and it has been successful in, uh, in the patient. But of course, it is not a very efficient tool because what is to be done is that every time it has to be taken, it's an ex vivo technique. Every time the cell has to be taken out and you have to replace the beta um, com compartment with a fetal uh, hemoglobin compartment. So the fet fetal hemoglobin alpha compartment has to be introduced over here in place of the beta compartment. So that amount of gene editing work has to be always done ex vivo. So every time you do that, it is possible to do with blood cells because after you have done this change, blood cells can be by intravenous injections. You can introduce these altered blood cells into the human being, but this cannot be a standardized protocol because for any editing tool, we have to understand that the editing component has become easier now, but the delivery component, the challenges still remain. So how the delivery is going to happen is uh, still a little bit of a controversy for us. So it's not a very effective tool as of, uh, it's, it's a good tool, but we do not know whether it's going to be very, very effective. So if these changes are made in the germline, we can see in the germline, uh, we've already discussed this, here the germline uh, changes have happened and this are moving on to the next generation. So here, it raises a lot of questions. Somebody has done it in secrecy. There was no proper informed consent by the parents. The parents did not know what uh, changes they are going to bring about. So globally, there was a lot of outcry that this kind of methods, but knowing uh, China, they do not really follow the protocols of clinical testing. And even if they do follow, follow some of the protocols of clinical testing, uh, they do not share their data with the scientific community most of the times. 
So, um, and there are some fraudulent clinical trial data that are there. So we cannot really depend upon the kind of work that has happened over there. So um, the kind of, kind of outcry that was raised, there are some concerns now. Um, the scientists sound some alarm over DNA editing in human embryos. And the second CRISPR human embryo transplant also shows that it's a long way to go. It is very, very difficult for us to understand that we will modify something and uh, it, it, it's not as easy. So we cannot just do it outside and uh, transplant that back into the cell because there are other, other things that we have to take into consideration. If it's a viral mediated delivery that we do, sometimes residual viral genomes can give rise to viral um, infections as well in the cell. So those kind of things have to be seen. But embryo editing in the UK um, has seen some green light. So we are in a position to see the beta thalassemia cure uh, to some extent, in the, uh, but it is not very successful everywhere. Only a few patients, this has been done. So it has to go through a lot of clinical um, research guidelines. And these guidelines um, over here, uh, mostly in individual countries, will have their own guidelines. So a nation is left free to, to decide how it would want to do because a global guideline cannot be possible. Every country is doing things on their own. And um, so there are some uh, requirements to be done. It has to be, it has to go through ethical committees. Every organization which does this kind of work must have an ethical team present in, the, in, their, um, in their labs, which finally understand whether, what kind of implication it is going to have, have on the society. So you are going to have in your ethical committee, not just scientists, you should have people from the religious communities. You should have people coming from um, layman. That means somebody who has no link with science, who are just representing the society. So those people should have a say in telling whether this has to be done on animal models, whether these, these have to be taken up to human models or trials. It has to go through many. So when we say that the, um, the clinical trial of, let's say, COVID vaccine is uh, on, in the pipeline, and nothing can really come so fast. It's not a quick fix method for us to get a vaccine so fast because if we get a vaccine that fast, that will be the efficacy of the vaccine. We actually has to, it has, actually has to go through number of rounds. This is a CRISPR mushroom. It has, uh, it has escaped the US regulation because in this, what has happened is that this particular uh, pro, uh, gene, the PPO gene, the uh, polyphenyl oxidase gene has been uh, edited. This gene is responsible for producing that brown coloration of uh, mushroom on long retention. If this uh, can be removed, then the shelf life of mushroom can be increased. This has been allowed by uh, the, US, um, organ uh, the US government only because this is not a new gene which has got introduced. It is we are playing only with the existing gene. So this has been allowed in US and this is the first CRISPR edited organism to be approved by the uh, United States. Uh, to improve the shelf life of uh, mushroom. And these are some of the interesting, unusual applications of uh, CRISPR that we see. In pet breeding, we can see in Dalmatians, which often carry the genetic mutations that make them prone to suffer from bladder stones. Um, this kind of uh, mutation can be done in the Dalmatians. So the pet lovers should be very, very happy because um, their, and their pets are going to survive much longer. It has also been done to produce allergy-free food. For example, wheat, uh, there are people who show gluten allergy, especially people who have problems in the, uh, who have colic pains usually because of gluten allergy. So the gluten component can be uh, edited in wheat to give rise to gluten-free wheat. You can look at, um, there are four egg whites, uh, proteins present in the egg white, and then the work is going on. Uh, to recognize uh, that this immune system could uh, cause reduction in the allergic reactions. So some of these proteins of egg white, which are the most prominent proteins, which cause allergy, we can work on and individually knock out each of them and see which one can actually um, remove the uh, allergic reactions by individuals. Decaf coffee can be created because the caffeine in coffee uh, is um, said to be mutagenic. And uh, especially uh, when uh, patients are pregnant, not, not say patients, when mothers um, cannot drink coffee in the pregnancy period uh, because if it has some teratogenic effect. So such decaf coffee can be created by knocking out the caffeine gene from coffee. So somebody who likes the flavor of coffee can still drink coffee without uh, the caffeine component in it. We can have greener fuels produced from algae by increasing the component of fats in them. 
the more the fat, the more uh, the biodiesel to be produced by them. So we can move into more greener fuels by using this CRISPR-Cas9 technology. We can also eradicate pests, like uh, some work has been done in UK on malaria. And um, in malaria, it has been seen that uh, when this uh, new gene is introduced into the mosquito, and there are uh, the male and the female mosquito, when they mate, uh, because of the presence of this new gene, uh, the, it stops the females from laying eggs. The eggs cannot be laid in the, um, by these um, female and office mosquito, and that's how you, can, uh, you cannot do something with the mosquito. The mosquitoes are, are, are surviving, but at least you can make sure that the amount of egg production is reduced. And uh, this has been successfully seen in the caged mosquitoes, but we don't know uh, whether the population will be wiped out by doing something like this. So these are some of the unusual applications that we see of uh, CRISPR-Cas9, and uh, of course in India also, there are some lot of there, there are a lot of work going on in IGIB in Delhi. There's work going on the similar kind of work that is seen in beta thalassemia by the UK group. That kind of work has been done on sickle cell anemia, where the the hemoglobin is uh, abnormal over there, and we are trying to knock it off to bring in uh, some uh, the 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 normal form of hemoglobin. For the survival of individuals. So I think um, it was a long talk and um, this is where we end and this is uh, where our journey of CRISPR-Cas9 and understanding CRISPR uh, ends over here and um, this, this tool allows a scientists to edit DNA in a much quicker way, cheaper way and more accurate way. So it's an exciting development that's opening up new possibilities for scientists across the globe working in a number of different fields, but looking beyond the lab is still very early days because we need to see the delivery mechanism. Ideas on how the technology might be adapted to treat diseases is, is something that we have to see. And more importantly, we have to also measure the risks associated with it because in case it binds somewhere else and there are slips, uh, then uh, the repercussion will be huge. And that is where uh, it has to be a very measured step that. Uh, molecular biologists need to take. Thank you all for patiently listening to this talk. Thank you very much, ma'am, for taking us to the deepful insights and emphasizing on genomic editing tool. Uh, ma'am, uh, participants has few questions. Would you like to answer it, ma'am? Sure, sure, please. You can, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the first question is, how can CRISPR be delivered to cells? Uh, for delivery of CRISPR to cells, if you want CRISPR to be delivered to cells, uh, we have, we, I've taken you through one of the uh, presentation slides where you saw that it can be introduced into the vector and that vector can gain entry into the cell by transfection means. So you have one vector in which you have the CRISPR-Cas9 and you have another vector in which you want the gene which you want to transfer. So that gene can come together. So if you are doing a co-transfection, it is possible. Uh, uh, we've shown in the slide how the transfection can happen, but there are all the same techniques that are possible for any kind of gene delivery. It could be conjugation, it could be transduction, it could be transfection, uh, it could be uh, it, it it could be microinjection, it could be uh, electroporation. The different methods that you have of gene delivery, all those methods can be followed uh, for allowing this kind of delivery to happen. But necessarily, it has to be a co-transfection process because. It is, if it is just knocked down or just removal or cutting of a gene, a single um, vector will be okay. But if you are looking at two different vectors, uh, if you want the, another uh, gene to be incorporated, then two vectors will be needed. So a co-transfection will be needed over there. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, the second question is, where are we? Is it worth the hype? Uh, well, of course, uh, the hype is more, uh, but but if this is definitely, as I said, this is definitely a tool, a cheap tool for us to take up uh, for genome editing. But we have to put our steps with a lot of caution. It cannot just happen that, uh, like the Chinese counterparts, we just cannot take this and uh, put it up uh, for um, an experimental uh, germline therapy. That may not happen because we have to take steps with a lot of caution because uh, we are actually playing against nature. So there is a huge chance that we are going to uh, disturb the ecological balance. So whether that ecological balance 
the disturbance is allowed that the ethical committees, the regulatory bodies have to see and let us know because uh, the effects can be far reaching. You can have huge effects. So whether are we ready to take those kind of effects or can the, can the, um, uh, the, the plus points of this outweigh the negative points that will result from this kind? So we have to weigh that properly before we take it up. Thank you, ma'am. The third question is, how does CRISPR-Cas9 compare to other genome editing tools? Uh, there, there are different uh, genome editing tools. If I can understand your question correctly, CRISPR-Cas9 is a genome editing tool and there are other genome editing tools also. Yes, there are other genome editing tools. We have shown you Talon is a genome editing tool. A zinc finger is a genome editing tool. You can simply cut a genome and introduce something with the help of a restriction enzyme. The advantage of CRISPR over here is that CRISPR, uh, the RNA sequence, which is the guide sequence, which actually will help you target to a, um, to a particular cell, uh, that you can design because that you're designing into the vector. And you are designing that, you are also designing the Cas9 upstream. So these two together will now be the tool. So the tool is in your hand. It is in your hand where you would like to take, take it. So this guide RNA, which is, if you look at a bacterial cell, the guide RNA is already present. And you are utilizing this technology in a eukaryotic cell. So you can now decide the sequence of the guide RNA to where you want the cutting to happen. So that, that way, uh, uh, this editing tool is much better. And of course, since it's an RNA editing tool, uh, the ease of making it is far more compared to a protein editing tool because making a protein uh, molecule is more difficult because it's one step further from RNA. The protein engineering tools have to be also looked into when you're using a protein tool, but here only the genome engineering work is enough for you to get a tool. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more question is, uh, any clinical trials already by FDA? Uh, I hope we have that much time for this question also. But yes, uh, uh, there are, uh, we, we've mentioned one of them, that's a beta thalassemia, uh, in which we are replacing, we are trying to replace the beta uh, component, which is abnormal in thalassemia, which is uh, the beta hemoglobin. Uh, that is being replaced by the fetal hemoglobin. This, has, this is go going through clinical trials because this is an ex vivo technique, okay? So it, the, the big blood cells have to be taken out, they have to be altered, and then they have to be re-injected back. This uh, ex vivo technique is there in the pipeline for FDA, uh, that is possible. And uh, this uh, currently is being done, this has also uh, been allowed in certain countries, as I said. In fact, in some places in the US, like in uh, Tennessee, this, is, uh, this has got the nod of the government and it has been tried out in one of the patients. The trials are happening in US, Europe and Canada for this. Uh, the second one that we can think of is, uh, there's one trial which is happening in, uh, with uh, T lymphocytes in, in uh, cancer treatment. The T lymphocytes, um, they can be modified so that they can specifically attack abnormal cells. So that, that, that's how the T lymphocytes are under, have undergone some change. And this therapy is called as CAR-T therapy, C-A-R-T, CAR-T therapy, where you are going to modify the T lymphocytes. But at the same time, this, uh, this therapy is not new. This therapy, this immunotherapy was there before. But uh, the T cells, what they do is that on their surface, they have certain receptors, which help them to recognize normal cells also. And this recognition between um, the receptor of T, uh, T lymphocyte and the normal cells does not allow the T lymphocyte to kill the normal cells, but the cytotoxic T cells can actually kill the other cells. That's what the you know, therapy is all about. But since it can recognize the normal cells also, cancer cells are very intelligent. So what they do is that they modify themselves and start expressing those uh, components which are recognized by the T cell for the survival of the, uh, of the cells. So if you are using the, ther the immunological therapy, which is called as a CAR-T therapy, along with a Cas9 technology to uh, knock out that receptor, the receptor is called as 
uh, I can't remember the name, but the receptor, I think it's called a PD-1 receptor or something. So if that receptor, uh, if you can knock out, then its ability to recognize uh, the cancer cell, if the cancer cell is smart, if you can be smarter and if you can remove that PD-1 by doing this, uh, then uh, this will this interaction of cancer cell, the cancer, the way the cancer cell is trying to fool the immune system, that cannot happen. And uh, this is undergoing uh, some trials. This is also in the pipeline for trial by FDA. One of them, which has been approved by FDA, this is uh, for uh, for an, for a disease which is called as uh, the blindness disease, which happens in youngsters. Uh, this is called as the LC, LCA, which is a, a disease where the photoreceptors are abnormal. So these abnormal photoreceptors can be replaced with uh, a good cop, that photoreceptor gene. And these can be directly injected into the eyes. This is, one, this is an in vivo technique. So directly into the eye you can do because these are organs which are external and um, the accessibility of the organs are easy. This is only one uh, in vivo technique which has undergone uh, the US FDA nod as yet compared to the other. And there are, there are many more. This is the few that I can think of. Yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, as we are running short of time due to the time constraint, uh, I will pick one last question which is more relevant to the present uh, scenario that is COVID-19. Uh, can I take up that, ma'am? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know whether I have the expertise to <laughs> handle COVID-19 because it's something yes. really, really, really uh, new. And uh, but I think uh, everybody would want to know why why we are yeah. not using this in COVID-19. <laughs> yes, COVID the question, uh, yes, ma'am, the same thing. Maybe, question. maybe can I, it be? I, 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 I don't have an answer, but I think uh, what probably would be the most suitable uh, thing for us to see is that here we need a recognition to happen. For, for Cas9 CRISPR to work, uh, there is a requirement for uh, a guiding RNA. And the guiding RNA for us is about uh, 22, 25, approximately 30 nucleotides. So uh, first of all, of course, there have been before coronavirus infections, and uh, we should be having spacers in, in uh, bacterial cells. But uh, if you look at uh, the coronavirus genome, which is a big genome, to find out where exactly our uh, guide RNA of the CASPER system, uh, the CRISPR system should go and bind, uh, that uh, will take some time. No? For us, we need that much of time to find out where exactly we can hit. Because the purpose is that the viral load has to come down uh, to some extent, and uh, or the viral proteins have to be blocked. These two areas we'll have to look at. So maybe we can look into that uh, genome, but looking at the genome size, which is about uh, here it is about a 30 KB kind of a size. So it will take some time for us to figure out that where exactly uh, we will be able to target. Yeah. Plus, uh, I, I don't know whether we will also maybe, uh, that will be at the experimental level, but then how do we deliver this into the cells, uh, into, the, into the individuals who are suffering? Because the suffering time is actually, there's a small window in which we have to do this. So unless we have been able to standardize the entire protocol, if you want a direct delivery into the lungs, the lungs are filled with mucus, will the delivery happen? But maybe we can think of this in, uh, in other patients. I mean, as a prophylactic measure, we can think of this because if this can be given to uh, not patients, but others who are prone to this kind of, a, uh, who are exposed to this, uh, if, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 could be used something. Maybe, maybe, maybe it can happen, but I, I, I'll, I'll probably not have the expertise to answer uh, beyond what I can think of in case of COVID-19. Yes. Thank you very much, madam, for the detailed information uh, and uh, giving us the very uh, uh, detailed information about uh, uh, genome editing tool. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. I request uh, all the participants uh, to note down the email IDs that is uh, projected on the screen. Due to the shortage of time, uh, uh, we are not able to pick all the questions. You can mail uh, all these queries to the shared uh, mail IDs. So that will mail you the will uh, mail you the answers for it.
The first mail ID is uh, nbasu2307 at gmail.com. And the second mail ID is uh, psudharani123 at gmail.com. Kindly mail all your queries uh, to the following mail IDs. And one more thing, uh, uh, all the participants will receive the feedback email on your registered email IDs after 24 hours of this, uh, after the completion of this webinar. Please fill the feedback form to avail your e-certificate. Now, we have come to an end of this webinar. Firstly, I thank Almighty for making today's webinar happen. It's my privilege to propose hearty vote of thanks to our guest speaker, Dr. Neelanjana Basu, madam, for accepting our invitation and for sparing time from her busiest schedule to grace the occasion. Today, we had an opportunity to hear your expertise knowledge on genome editing tool, and it will surely enlighten our minds in our future endeavors. My gratitude to you, Dr. Nilanjana Basu, madam, on behalf of our AMC college for gracing the occasion and sharing your immense knowledge. Thank you very much, madam. I thank Mr. Rahul Kaluri, sir, Executive Vice President, AMC City Group of Institutions, and all the members of the management for their great support in organizing this webinar. I thank our respected principal, Dr. Prakash Duvari, sir, and our beloved HOD, Dr. P. Sudharani, madam, for being the catalyst that stimulated us to do our best in the webinar and standing as a pillar of strength for their constant overwhelming support and guidance to make this webinar possible. Our thank sincere, you. thank you very much, sir. Our sincere thanks to all the participants and professors for your patience hearing, spending your valuable time for a beneficial cause and making this webinar possible. Thank you, everyone.